Welcome back and now for the news in detail. Pakistan's permanent representative to the United Nations, Dr. Malia Lodi, has said the voice of Kashmiris has been heard around the world through Friday's Security Council meeting. Earlier, in an interview with Indus News, Lodi said the occupied Kashmir has been turned into a jail. Dr. Malia Lodi said several countries wanted an independent investigation into Indian atrocities in Indian occupied Kashmir. She also highlighted the other aspects of the United Nations Security Council meeting. Two other aspects of the council meeting are extremely important from Pakistan's point of view. One, the fact that the meeting took place at all testified to the international nature of the dispute and nullified India's claim and its propaganda that Jammu and Kashmir is an internal matter. Thirdly, or secondly, the most important aspect of the meeting was also that there was almost unanimous concern about the grave human rights situation in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Dr. Malia Lodi explained how serious the international community is taking the Kashmir issue. We have entered a significantly different phase in terms of world attention on the plight of the Kashmiris. If you look at international opinion as reflected in leading newspapers like the New York Times, the Guardian, the Financial Times, you name it. And Western public opinion as reflected in these publications are very clear. Concern for human rights and urging India to halt its crackdown as well as its lockdown in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. In addition, if you look at the statements coming out from every, virtually every human rights organization, reputable human rights organization in the world, all have spoken out. All have asked India to halt the kind of restrictions, abuse and violations that are going on. Dr. Malia Lodi also told Indus News the steps Pakistan is going to take after the meeting. We will assess the situation. We will see what would be the next step. But one thing I can assure you, Pakistan's diplomatic efforts, which have intensified since August 5, in response to India's illegal annexation of Jammu and Kashmir, those efforts will be stepped up and we will continue to ensure that we are able to act on behalf of the Kashmiri people. Meanwhile, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has welcomed the UN Security Council meeting held exclusively to discuss the situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir. Khan said it is for the first time in over 50 years that the world's highest diplomatic forum has taken up the dispute. The Prime Minister said the UN Security Council meeting was a reaffirmation of 11 resolutions recognizing Kashmir's right to self-determination. Khan said it is the responsibility of the Security Council to address the suffering of the Kashmir's people. In another development, Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi has talked to his Canadian counterpart over current Indian atrocities in occupied Kashmir. In his telephone conversation with Canadian Foreign Minister Christia Freeland, Qureshi apprised her about sufferings of the people in occupied valley. Freeland said her country is deeply concerned about the human rights violations by Indian troops in the occupied Kashmir. Qureshi also held separate telephonic conversations with the Dutch and Spanish foreign ministers. Spanish foreign minister Jose Borre said Madrid is closely monitoring the situation in Kashmir. Meanwhile, Foreign Minister Qureshi chaired a special committee meeting in Islamabad to discuss the Kashmir issue. Human rights violations in Indian-occupied Kashmir and ceasefire violations by Indian forces at the line of control were also discussed. The United States says Afghan peace talks are moving in the right direction. The White House statement came after the U.S. President Donald Trump met with his national security officials to discuss the dialogue with the Taliban. The meeting was attended by Defense Secretary Mark Esper, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo 
and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford. Trump described the meeting as very good, saying the U.S. and Taliban are looking for a deal to end the war. The U.S. and the Taliban representatives recently met for eighth round of talks in Doha. Sudan's military rulers and the protest leaders are set to formally sign the historic power-sharing deal in Khartoum today. The deal will be inked during a ceremony in the presence of leaders of the neighboring countries. The signing will bring into effect a constitutional declaration inked on August the 4th. The transition deal was reached after a public uprising that was meant to pave the way for civilian rule. The composition of the new civilian majority ruling council will be announced tomorrow. The new Prime Minister will be named on Tuesday. The White House has approved an $8 billion sale of warplanes to Taiwan. The U.S. State Department says Taipei will receive 66 F-16s under the deal. China's Foreign Ministry says it has lodged a solemn representation with the U.S. against the sale. Spokesperson Hua Shun Yin says the deal violates the One China principle. This follows a $2 billion U.S. arms sales to Taiwan in July. It included 100 tanks, 250 Stinger missiles. China considers Taiwan a renegade province. The purchase comes amid heightened trade tensions between the U.S. and China. The U.S. Justice Department has obtained a court warrant for the seizure of an Iranian tanker captured by British Marines of Gibraltar last month. The court order came after Gibraltar judge allowed the release of the vessel detained for violating European Union sanctions on Syria. The warrant says the ship Grace One and the two million barrels of oil it carries are subject to forfeiture. It also ordered the seizure of a million dollars from an account linked to Paradise Global Trading. The Justice Department claims the company is associated with businesses acting for Iran's Revolutionary Guards. Meanwhile, Grace One has been renamed, reflagged and moved its position, but is still anchored at Gibraltar. Fifteen civilians have been killed in a Russian airstrike in the northern Syrian province of Idlib. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says the air raid targeted refugee camps in the town of Hus. It says six children were among those dead. The French Foreign Ministry has condemned the attack and called for an immediate end to fighting in Idlib. Over the past week, the Syrian army has advanced towards the rebel stronghold of al Sheikhoun. Meanwhile, a U.S.-Turkey joint operations center will begin work, work next week to oversee a safe zone in northern Syria. Turkey's defense minister says the two countries have reached a general agreement on coordination and control of airspace. The statement comes after a U.S. delegation visited Syria in southern Turkey to begin work on the center. The joint center was agreed upon last week after days of tense negotiations between the two countries. The planned buffer near the Turkish frontier would be kept with heavy weapons. Israeli forces have wounded 67 Palestinians during weekly protests along the Gaza border. Palestine's health ministry says Israeli troops fired live ammunition and rubber bullets at the protesters. The demonstrations are calling for Israel to lift its blockade of the Gaza Strip. Officials say over 300 Palestinians have been killed since the start of weekly protests last year. A Palestinian driver was also shot dead by occupation forces after the, he allegedly entered an illegal Jewish settlement block in the West Bank. Meanwhile, Israeli warplanes have struck three Hamas underground bases in the north and the center of the Strip. Two ISIS militants have been killed in an Iraqi airstrike in the eastern province of Diyala. The head of Iraq's security committee, Sadiq al husseini says two of the terrorist group's financiers have also been captured. al husseini says security forces acted on intelligence reports. Despite repeated military operations, he says ISIS remnants are hiding out in rugged areas near the border with Iran. 
The Saudi-led military coalition fighting in Yemen has intercepted a Houthi drone launched at Aba airport in the south of the kingdom. A spokesperson for the Yemeni rebels, Yahya Sadia, claims the attack caused the suspension of air traffic at Aba airport. The Saudi state media says a drone targeting the kingdom was shot down. In Yemen's other Saudi-led coalition warplanes, a fight flares near camps occupied by southern separatist fighters. Russian opposition activists are staging another protest in Moscow after police detained thousands in recent demonstrations. The demonstrators defied a crackdown to demand free and fair elections for Moscow's city legislature. The protests are being held in single-person pickets in which one person holds a protest sign at a time. The Election Commission has disqualified a number of opposition candidates on technical grounds. The protesters are demanding their candidates be allowed to contest September's local government elections. Earlier, Moscow City Court overruled the Commission's decision, allowing opposition candidate Sergei Mitrokhin to contest the polls. Over 3,000 activists were arrested during the two recent demonstrations. Eight people have been killed in a fire at a hotel in Ukrainian port of Odessa. Emergency services said 10 others were injured in the blaze. It took five fighters over three hours to extinguish the fire, which incinerated an area of about a thousand square meters. The authorities have not yet determined the cause of the blaze. It's a time for a short break, but coming up next in the bulletin. Welcome back. The opposition Liberal Democrat Party has unveiled its candidates to lead an emergency UK government. The Liberal Democrat leader Joe Swinson nominated former Labour deputy leader Harriet Harman and Tory veteran Kenneth Clark. Rather than name party members, Swinson said the Liberal Democrats preferred alternative leaders for a unity government to stop a no-deal Brexit. She said the Labour and Conservative veterans agreed to assume the role. Earlier this month, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn called for a no-confidence vote in Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government. Corbyn suggested he would subsequently lead a caretaker government and call a snap election. Liberal Democrat leader Swinson has refused to support Corbyn. Greenland has dismissed the idea of being sold to the United States after reports said US President Donald Trump raised the idea of buying the Danish territory. Greenland's Foreign Minister Al Lohenbeger says Arctic Island is open for business but not for sale. Danish politicians report scorn on Trump's idea. Trump is due to visit Denmark in September. Greenland has long been coveted by world powers because of its natural resources and strategic location in the North Atlantic. Denmark turned down a $100 million American offer for Greenland in 1946. Two Ebola cases have been confirmed in the Democratic Republic of Congo's South Kivu region for the first time. Health officials say cases open up a new front in the fight against the outbreak, which has killed over 1,800 people this year. Health officials and aid workers say virus can establish a foothold in the densely populated urban center. Congo's first Ebola case was detected in mid-July. Since then, the World Health Organization has warned spread of the disease could accelerate. Congo is taking steps to counter Ebola with the help of African Union and the UN. Thousands of policymakers from 180 countries will meet in Geneva tomorrow to tighten rules protecting endangered species. Specialists will evaluate changes to regulations and protection listings under the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. The Convention Secretary General Yvonne Huguera says conference will seek to extend protection to additional species threatened by human activity. Discussions in Geneva will focus on illegal trade in ivory, rhino horn and endangered species amid growing alarm over increasing extinction rates. The four-year-old treaty regulates trade in over 35,000 plant and animal species. It also provides a mechanism to help crack down on illegal trade and impose sanctions on countries violating rules. The meeting comes after UN reports said a million species are on brink of extinction. 
As sea levels rise due to global warming, time is running out for Indonesia's capital city of Jakarta. Environmental experts warn a third of the city could be underwater by 2050. As weather patterns change, large swathes of land have already begun disappearing at a faster rate. More in this report. Indonesia's capital isn't only sinking because of rising temperatures, rapid, out-of-control urbanization is also to blame. Without a piped water system, homes and local industry are forced to tap into natural aquifers. Experts say this practice causes some parts of Jakarta to sink 25 centimeters a year. Back in 1981, this area was land, but it was muddy land. It could be flooded during a high tide, but just a little. Over the years, the water level is slowly rising. The local government seems to have accepted the city's fate has already been sealed. Indonesian leader Joko Widodo has already announced the capital will be moving to the island of Borneo. Meanwhile, residents are hoping walls along the shoreline at the most vulnerable areas will keep the water from rising further. Now, why has the water level become higher than my home? And I am now below water level? Maybe because the sea water is eating up the soil little by little. That's what I know. But luckily, we now have that sea wall. If groundwater extraction isn't curbed, the city could be gone within a few decades. Jakarta is home to 10 million residents. In the U.S., deep-fried corn dogs in democracy are mixing at the Iowa State Fair. It is expected over a million people will be at the event this year, which is a must-stop for 2020 presidential hopefuls. 23 Democrats and Republican primary challenger to President Donald Trump will present their case to Iowa's people during the fair's 11-day run. This report has the details. Thanks for stopping by to vote. Here at the Iowa State Fair, visitors can vote for their favorite presidential candidate more than a year out from the 2020 elections. The ballots at this largely agricultural fair are corn kernels, and the many Democratic candidates are all represented. On the Republican side, Donald Trump appears all but guaranteed his party's nomination. The trend today is uh, uh, all Republicans are voting for Donald Trump. All Democrats are split, mostly with Biden at 35 percent. Nice to see you again. The former vice president is the front runner in national polls and is treated like a movie star here. But even the less well-known candidates hit up the fair with the hopes of making a name for themselves in this early voting state. The fair is a crucial way for candidates to connect with the voters who could make or break their presidential dreams, but not without a little fun in the form of pig races and fried corn dog tastings. Mike is taking his voting responsibility very seriously. The environmental activist went to see every single Democratic candidate at the fair this year. Yeah. I don't think it's dividing the party, but I think we need to start weeding some of them out to eliminate them. I think they need to self-select and say, I'm, I'm only a 1 percent. In July 2020, the Democratic National Convention will finally reveal their pick to face Donald Trump. And this predominantly white and Christian state, whose population represents only 1 percent of voters in the U.S., will ultimately determine who stays in the race. Lows and the highs of the business world now, the U.S. has excluded some Chinese-made household furniture, baby goods, and internet modems from its next round of tariffs. The U.S. Trade Representative's office says the 10% duties are scheduled to go into effect on September the 1st. It says 44 categories of goods are no longer subject to punitive tariffs on $300 billion worth of Chinese exports. The excluded goods, which also include some chemical compounds, are worth about $7.8 billion a year. Earlier this week, the U.S. delayed the imposition of more than half of its proposed tariffs until December the 15th. Chinese and the U.S. Trade Representative will hold another round of talks in two weeks' time. Turkey's military pension fund, OYAK, has signed a provisional agreement to take over British Steel. OYAK says the deal by its affiliate, ATR Holding, will close by the end of this year. The British Steel deal will potentially save thousands of jobs. Britain has welcomed the deal, but a workers' union has urged the government to protect the industry from damage caused by Brexit. British Steel was forced into liquidation on May the 22nd due to lack of funding to secure its operations.
And now the weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. For further updates, stay tuned to Indices.